Hello there. This is Pastor John Carlo, Senior Pastor of Christian Pentecostal Church. And we are continuing our Bible study on the steps of Jesus, his ministry from the beginning all the way to his ascension. Last week we left off where in John number 7, the seventh chapter, Jesus had come into Jerusalem from Bethany, a trip of over almost 100 miles, to be there for what is called the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a remembrance of how God had taken them out of slavery in Egypt. One of three feasts where all Jewish people had to come to Jerusalem, the men especially, to be part of this. We also see, as we look at it in John 7, what people thought of Jesus. As we read it, we get, a, we get an idea. Jesus is walking into what seems to be a trap, but he knows it from these religious leaders. It tells us, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Right? And now as the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand, and he and his brethren depart to go to Jerusalem to be part of this. Right? Verse 4 tells us that his own brethren, rather verse 5, did not believe in him. His brethren here are not the disciples, but his brothers and sisters. He had four brothers, and we know at least two sisters, by Joseph and Mary after, of course, his birth. And then apparently Jesus lets his disciples know something, even though that we're going to see even today, there are times when the Jews wanted to kill him. The religious people wanted to do away with him because he kind of shook the tree. And Jesus tells his disciples, my time is not yet come. It's interesting that he knows exactly what's going to happen to him and when. But this was not the time when he would be killed. The world cannot hate you, it says, but it hateth me. It hates him, right? Because I testify of it, and the works thereof are evil. Now again, he's talking to the works, not just of the people, but he is very critical of the works of the religious leaders who had used religion to capture the people and to keep them in bondage, spiritual bondage and control, right? Now here comes Jesus, and he's kind of shaking this up, right? Look at verse 10 in John 7. But when his brethren were gone up, right? And, and then went he also unto the feast, not openly, but as if it were in secret. And the Jews, speaking about the leaders, the Jewish leaders, sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And again, there was much murmuring among the people. And some of them said, and we saw this last week. It was interesting how all these people heard and saw Jesus' ministry, and they all saw him differently. Some saw him he was a just man in verse 12 of chapter 7. Some thought he was a deceiver, also in the same verse. Some recognized him as, the master, as a master teacher in, in verses 14 and 15. Some looked upon him as a Sabbath breaker, right? And then we see, and the reason for the Sabbath breaker is really interesting. He's a Sabbath breaker because he heals a man who had an infirmity for 38 years and gets healed on the Sabbath. <laughs> and Jesus broke the law by doing that. I don't think the man who got healed was thinking that way. Again, some viewed him as a, viewed him as a prophet, and some accepted him as his, their Messiah. But unfortunately, it was only a minority of people. Jesus also, in the same chapter, predicts his ascension, how they will seek him, and so on, unsuccessfully. He also says there will be Another prediction in, in uh, John 7, 37 to 39, when he's talking about the Holy Spirit is going to come and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we know this takes place in the book of Acts in the second chapter. And again, the Holy Spirit will be not just with us, but in us. This is very important for us today to realize this, that Jesus left, went back to the Father to intercede for us, but he didn't leave us alone. 
He left the Spirit of God in his people, dwelling in his people, to lead and guide us in all the situations that we unfortunately encounter in life. Then in verse 50 of chapter 7, we see one of the Pharisees. There were a number of Pharisees, very small number of them, that either had some kind of saw favor in Jesus or that they were interested in what he was saying. And one of them was a man named Nicodemus. He was one of the judges, one of the Pharisees. And he comes to him, the Bible tells us, by night. You can read this story in chapter 7, 50, verses 50 to 53. And the interesting part of the conversation is Jesus tells him he must be born again. Now, now we know the Bible today and we understand what the words mean, but imagine in the time of Nicodemus, he was an older man, somebody saying to him or to you, you must be born again. And he gave the same answer we'd probably give. What are you talking about? Can I go back in my mother's womb? and be born again? He saw it in the physical realm. But Jesus, of course, was speaking in the spiritual realm. But apparently, Nicodemus, and we also see him not only here, but later on, he is one of two people that come and ask for the body of Jesus so they can bury him. So apparently, Nicodemus kept studying Jesus' ministry and apparently became a follower. But again, he was very careful in how he approached Jesus. We read also, as we go into chapter 8 of John, that Jesus comes up, it says, early in the morning, he'd gone to the Mount of Olives, I guess, to pray, and he comes again into the temple. And he, and he saw all the people, and he sat down and began to teach them. Remember, Jesus was not only our Savior, but he was a teacher. Most of the things he tells us in his ministry are to teach us the truth about himself, about God, about life, all of these different things. In fact, we see in cases, many cases, he's called rabbi. The word rabbi means teachers, a teacher. And it, it see, seems that these religious people, knowing that Jesus was asking questions and also saying things that kind of shook the tree that, and the things that they were in charge of. Remember, they held on to all the Mosaic laws, and there were plenty of them. We went over that last week for every type of situation, every type of relationship, right? But one of the things that we notice is that there was a very strong law against adultery. Adultery is simply a person who is married to a, a woman has sexual relationship to, with another woman that he's not married to, whether she's married or not. This is called adultery in the word of God. But unfortunately for the adulterer, the people who were involved in adultery, it was a death penalty. And here, the scribes, the scribes who were those that copied the word of God meticulously and the Pharisees brought him a woman taken in the act of adultery. Now, as we go through this story, remember something. It takes two people to commit adultery. And here she is all by herself, taken in the act, right? And they set her in her midst. I could, I could see them just throwing her down on the floor. But that's my way of saying it. And they said unto him, Master. Notice how they address him, Master, right? They didn't think he was a master but they're trying to be polite, to trap him. She was taken, this woman was taken or found in the very act of adultery. In the very act, I mean, no question about it, right? Where's the guy? Where's the other person, right? Now they remind Jesus of the Mosaic law. And they say to him, now we know uh, Moses in, in his law commanded us, right, an order that such person should be stoned. That, that, we're not talking about drugs or alcohol here. We're talking about a situation where the person would be taken to the, to the leaders or the, of, a, of a city or town and a court would take place. And if the person was found guilty, they would be taken out of the city or out of the town and stoned. 
But you needed at least two witnesses. And those witnesses had to swear that they saw whatever it was they were accusing this person of. If it turned out after the person was killed for this and they found out that the witnesses lied, they also would be stoned for, uh, for uh, in this case, of murder. So this is a very serious thing as far as they're concerned. Now, they tell Jesus what the law is, but they're asking him, what do you think we should do? It's kind of a trick question, right? How would you answer that question? Look what Jesus does. He doesn't say anything. He didn't say, well, Moses said, said this, but you know that. No, he didn't do anything like that. It says here in verse 6, he stooped down, meaning he bent down, and apparently there was a lot of soil there on the ground, and with his finger, he began to write something in the dust of the ground. He didn't answer them verbally. Apparently, he answers them by writing something or things in and on the ground. Now, imagine them. They want an answer. And the man stoops down, he starts writing. Naturally, if that was you and I, we want to know, what are you doing? What are you writing, right? <laughs> but they still continued asking him. What should we do? What should we do? What do you say we should do? He lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. The accusers were always casting the first stone because that stone, in most cases, this heavy stone dropped on your head or on your chest would kill you. So they're asking him to kill her or to, or to at least make that statement that she should be killed. But again, he stoops down on the ground and they watch him. I like verse 9. And they had which heard it being convicted by their own conscience. Now, wait a minute. I know you raised your hand, right? What are you talking about? He doesn't answer them. He's writing on the ground, yet they get convicted, meaning that their conscience is telling them something. After Jesus said, let him was without sin. What, he, what could he be writing? The only thing that makes sense is he's writing their secret sins. Maybe the name of a woman they were having an affair with. Maybe the name of a man they were having an affair with. Maybe an amount of money they had stolen. In other words, he was writing their sins. After he had said, let him who was without sin cast the first stone. He didn't say, don't carry out the law of Moses. He said, let's have somebody who's perfect, sinless. Let you do it. Now, what happened? Hmm. Meanwhile, the woman was there. In their midst, they're waiting to see her punished. And all of a sudden, Jesus stands up and again he speaks. And he saw none of the accusers, but the woman by herself. And he said to her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? See, this is the law. Someone had to condemn her. Someone had to testify against her. Someone had to say, I saw it. She did it. And, this, and, this, and in this case, she, they would be the accusers. This is like a court. I don't know whether she noticed it right away. But she says to him, looking around, I guess, I don't know whether they beat her up, or are you getting it, who knows? But she apparently notices they're not there. And he said, no man, Lord. I like the word Lord here. She recognized this was not just a, an ordinary person. This was somebody important that she was talking to. No man, Lord. Then Jesus says these words, neither do I condemn thee. 
go and sin no more. Wow. I think what's also implied here is that he forgave her. I think it's safe to say that. But notice, if he forgave her, he's also thinking something I would have been thinking. Well, this woman gets a break on this case. Is she going to go back and start all over again with another guy or another place? Uh, you know, say, well, I'm not going to go back to that place and, and commit adultery. I'll find another place. No. He says, go and sin no more. And he says that in a number of cases in, with people that he meets that are in a sin situation. Again, as we go through this chapter, we're going to see Jesus coming and meeting this man, Nicodemus. We go to verse 50. And we see this man. He's a Pharisee. He's an important man. He's a man that is, is interested in what Jesus has to say. He doesn't understand everything, right? And as I said before, this man, during Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem, becomes one of his defenders. But he's only one of a few that try to defend Jesus. Let's see what happens. Again, notice this, and I said it before. Jesus is constantly at odds with the religious people the leaders, because they have become not just the religious leaders, they control the people with their laws, with their, with their presence, and so on. They're afraid of them. Let's take a look. Let's look at John, the eighth chapter. Verse 14 and then verse 21. In fact, let's go back to 12. It says, Then spoke Jesus again unto them, saying, I, now he's talking not to the other people that left. Apparently, there was not only the Pharisees listening to this, there was a crowd. Jesus was confronting the leaders of the temple. I would, if I was there, I would want to know what's going on. But look what he says. Jesus said unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. This is interesting. He had come to show a light on the dark things, the dark places, the dark people. Right? He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. One of, Jesus, one, of, one of the things that Jesus came to earth for was to shine a light in the religion that the people were practicing. There were no way, you couldn't question it. You couldn't, you couldn't, you only had to follow it. And if you didn't, there was punishment coming, right? Now again, here come the Pharisees. They come to him, thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Who do you think you are, right? And then Jesus says this, though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. And we could add to it, but yours isn't, right? The things I have done, and so on, as opposed to what they were doing. And he goes on to say, for I know whence I came, and whether I go, but ye cannot tell which, where, whence I came, or where I came from, and where I'm going. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. He didn't come as a judge. He came as a savior. But it's interesting to note when we get into the book of Revelation, Jesus will be a judge. He will judge all of the people of the earth. We will all stand before him the righteous and the unrighteous, and so on. And then he said, and yet, if I judge, my judgment is true. 
For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. This is a dangerous thing to say. What he's saying is, God sent me, and we're like this, right? It is written in your law, oh boy, that the testimony of two men or two witnesses is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. He gave them his credentials, and why he is and was and said what he was saying, right? And when they said unto him, where is thy father? Jesus answered, ye neither know me nor my father. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. Wow, this is a dangerous answer. He's saying, if you've seen the father, or if you've seen me, you've seen the father. We're like this, right? Wow. It says, these words Jesus spoke in the treasury or the place where they, they brought their offerings and tithes as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him for his hour was not yet come. Wow. Then Jesus again said to the same people, I go my way and ye shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Wow, this is judgmental, isn't it? He's prophesying here because of your religious beliefs. You are going to die in your sin. I was talking to someone today about that. People are stuck in religions and telling people to do things that are not scriptural. For example, one of the things people are taught is you have to confess sins to a person. Then that person takes it and gives it to another person and another person and finally someone gives it to God. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we as believers, as believers in Jesus Christ, we can go to him directly for everything, including our confession, if we've sinned. He is the one who intercedes for us. No person can forgive our sins except for Jesus Christ. And the reason for that is very simple. His blood was shed on the cross of Calvary. That blood cleansed our sins. Before this, the sacrifice of animals and the shedding of their blood covered their sins symbolically. And they had to go through a whole procedure. But here in Christ, there's a new covenant. And that new covenant says, wherever you are, no matter what is going on, we can talk to God. Whether it's asking for prayer for a need or for forgiveness. Believing that a man, another person, can forgive our sins and then going back into our life, we're not forgiven. The only one that could say you're forgiven is Jesus Christ. He is the only one. Look at verse 23. Now he's talking to these religious people. Now this is powerful stuff. And he said unto them, ye are from beneath. Oh, I don't think he was meaning they were in the basement. I think he was saying, you people are from, the, from hell. That's where you're sending people. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. Oh, wow. Remember, he's talking to the elect, the, 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 the leaders of the, of, the, of the church, of the tabernacle, the priests, right? The holy ones. They would walk around the city with robes and have little bells on them and let everybody know that a righteous person's walking by and so on. They expected almost adoration from the people. Ye shall die in your sins. Wow. Prophetic. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. Now this sounds kind of odd. He's saying, I am the Father. I am the Holy Spirit. 
I am the son of God. I am the same one from the beginning of creation. That's who I am. Wow. And there he comes. Many people don't think that Jesus ever got angry, but when you read some of these words that he, he is saying, he has to be angry to say it. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world, choose those things which I have heard of him. In other words, God has sent me here to be your judge. Now he's not talking to the ordinary person. He is talking for the leaders of the temple. But look at verse 27. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. He was giving them an opportunity, really, to realize how, how they had taken the faith, their faith in God, and had twisted it and, and messed it up to the point where it was not what God wanted. And they were causing people to go to hell, to die in their sins. Wow. Let's take a look. He goes on to say this. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed in him, if ye continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The same person I was talking to about confession, I said, I want you to do something. Do you have a Bible? Go home and read the New Testament. Read it for yourself. Don't believe what I'm trying to tell you. The truth is the book. The truth is what the word of God is saying, not what some person is saying. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father except through me. That, that excludes every minister, every priest, every rabbi. The only one that we can get to God with or through is Jesus Christ, because he paid the price. Oh, hallelujah. The next part of the, these people don't give up. The next part of the conversation is just as foolish. And they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. Now sayest thou that you should be made free? In other words, Abraham, you know the way Abraham was, the man that God calls out of idol worship and becomes the father of the Jewish people. But a man of faith, a man who believed God, a man that had a relationship with God that was very close. And out of Abraham's loins come God's people, the Jewish people. And now they're using that fact to prove what Jesus is saying is wrong. And Jesus said, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. Now, this was an insult. He's talking about them. And the servant abideth not, abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the, if the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be in free indeed. What did he mean? Free from what? Free from sin. As we continue, Jesus says this to these beautiful and I say beautiful in a sense because that's what they thought they were. These are the sons and daughters of Abraham, thinking that because of that, they can do whatever they want. Look at verse 37. He says, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. What I'm trying to tell you that will get, set you free, you don't want to hear. You don't even know that you're locked up. You're enchained by religion, right? And then he tells them, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which you have seen with your father. What was he talking about? And they said, answered and said, 
Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Wow. This is a slap in the face. But now you seek to kill me? A man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Abraham listened to God and followed him, right? Let me end with this. We'll pick up here next week. But after this long conversation back and forth, I want to leave you with this. The same chapter, chapter 8 of John, the 58th verse. Look what Jesus says. You ready? Before, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. That's grammatically incorrect. What was the message? The message was, I was before Abraham. Why? Because he was God. He was there at creation. All of these things. Wow. How did they react to this? Verse 59, they took up stones to cast at him, to kill him. But Jesus, now, I know this isn't the King James, but I'm going to bring it into the modern language. It says Jesus hid himself. He hid himself. And he went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Do you like Skyfi? This is what Jesus did. He became the invisible man. He was there, and one next minute he wasn't there, the next second, and he walked right past them. They didn't see him. Jesus is amazing. Again, we'll stop here. We'll pick up on it next week. We'll see another instance later on where Jesus, the same thing happens. They're ready to kill him, and he walks right through them. They don't see him. If you're out there, listening to this Bible study, get into the Bible. Pray and re start reading it, especially Jesus' ministry, because he came not only for the Jew, but he came for everyone. And because the Jew rejected him, we became part of the family of God. Read what Jesus says, because his words are life and life eternal. And I pray that you will find the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you'll find out that men and women cannot save you. He's the only answer. He's the only one. And the book that we call the Bible has all the things that we need to know so that we can live in this terrible world and be child, children of God. God bless you, keep safe, and keep reading the word.